In this video, we are going to walk through the steps for performing a basic estimate of stress in a component using finite element analysis in SOLIDWORKS. All right, so the first thing to do is uh, to save your parts. If you haven't done so, sometimes you'll uh, need to reset. So I recommend saving and rebuilding frequently. Uh, we've saved this as uh, iBeam. Uh, the next thing to do is define material. Sometimes uh, when you're just modeling the component, it's there's no need to define the material, but we need it in order to perform finite element analysis. So you can right click on the material over here and let's just pick one of the default options of plain carbon steel. Now, uh, if I can, if I right click here and say edit material, I can see all the material properties. Um, it, it's okay if those material properties don't exactly match the material you expect to use. Uh, the things that are important to get reasonably close to accurate are the elastic modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Uh, because that's gonna tell us how the part deforms when it's loaded. And as we saw, that can be important for what the reaction forces are uh, in the component. And it's especially important in assembly analysis. <clears throat> but uh, it's okay for our purposes here if say the yield strength doesn't match the material that you actually plan to use. And that's because we can simply take the results of the FEA analysis and, and the, find the peak stress and just compare it to our uh, more accurate reference value to calculate factor of safety on our own. All right, so once we've got our material uh, defined and our part saved, we'll want to go to the simulation tool. Uh, now, if you don't see simulation up here in these tabs, we can enable it. And what you'll do is go up to this little gear icon and there's a, a downwards pointing arrow next to it. Click on that. You'll see add-ins. Click on that and a menu will pop up. And about halfway down, you'll find SolidWorks simulation. I'm gonna check both boxes here. And that means that the simulation tool will start up every time you start SolidWorks. All right, then we're gonna start a new study. So we'll go to simulation, click new study. And there are two types of study we'll use frequently in this class, static and buckling. And static is the one we'll use to estimate stress and deflection. So we'll stick with that and green check mark. Now you'll see that uh, uh, some new items have appeared in our tree down here and a new tab has appeared at the bottom here, telling, allowing us to switch between the model and our static simulation. So the new items in our tree are the simulation itself. And we can right click that to change options. We'll do that later. The I beam, that's our component. Uh, we won't do anything with that uh, for today. Connections, and that defines how multiple components in an assembly analysis interact with each other. So it's not relevant to a single part analysis. And that brings us to fixtures. And this is uh, the most common and basic step in FEA. So if I right click on fixtures, you can see there's a bunch of different ways we can constrain geometry. And the first and most common is simply fixing geometry. So we'll click that. And uh, there's a helpful little animation here showing what this means. We're gonna go over to this left-hand surface of the I-beam and uh, hover over that plane, click on it. And these little green icons have appeared. And that says that this surface won't be allowed to move at all when the part is loaded, which is what we'd like for this cantilever beam problem. So let's say green check mark. Uh, the next item we see on our tree here is external loads. If we right click on this, we'll see there's a bunch of different kinds of loads we can apply. Again, the simplest and most common is at the top and that's force. So this is a end loaded cantilever beam. So we'd like to go to the other end of the beam, hover over this face and click on it. And you'll see some purple arrows appear and that indicates the force that's going to be applied. Now these arrows are not pointing in the direction we'd like. We'd like them to be orthogonal to the, to the surface, the top surface of the beam and not normal to that end surface. Uh, so we'll go over here and instead of the, the normal direction, we'll choose a selected direction. And then you can pick any line that is aligned that's parallel with the direction that you'd like the force to be applied and select it see that our purple arrows now face the right way. So we're good on direction. Next, magnitude. So we'll come down here to units. And since we used 
English units in the example, we'll use them here as well, and apply 5,000 pounds force and green check mark. Okay, so now when you look at the part, you can see the big choices for how it's set up. We've got this end fixed and this end has an applied force. Uh, now, from this point, you could simply click run this study and it would create a mesh and perform the analysis, but let's take a look at what that mesh uh, actually is. So if I right click here and say, create a mesh, then, and we'll just use the default settings. Um, the way that finite element analysis works is that we take this solid body and we approximate it by a finite number of simpler elements. And there are two kinds. There are these lines that represent links and intersection points that are nodes. And if you approximate the body like this, it becomes kind of like a big trust problem that you remember from your statics course, where each of these links is a two-force member and the sum of all the forces at each node has to be zero. And if you set that up, you'll get a large number of equations, but uh, they're all uh, coupled and you'll get an exactly solvable set of linear equations and a big sparse matrix that you can then use uh, linear algebra tools to solve. All right, and if we reconsider what we've done here for uh, fixtures, when we fix the surface, what we really said is that these nodes can't move when this part is loaded. And so there must be forces here, the reaction forces, sufficient to keep those, load, those nodes from moving. And that, that means we have some exact reaction forces required there. And on this other end, we've said we want a total of 5,000 pounds force on the surface. And what that really means is we're gonna add a force to each of these nodes uh, that, so we've distributed that 5,000 pounds appropriately across the nodes on the surface. And then that will be involved in uh, each of those calculations. Okay, um, something else to think about is that the accuracy of our results will depend on how fine the mesh is. Uh, so you can see that over here, there's just a few nodes per unit space and, and here they're more dense. The software has identified there's a, a smaller feature here and it's trying to add more nodes and links so that it gets a more accurate result there. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. Okay, so we now have our problem fully set up. We can click run this study and the solver will uh, perhaps recreate the mesh and then calculate how much each of those links, uh, how much force each of those links must have on it, how much it would stretch, and then map that back into an estimate of the distribution of stress and strain for the whole part. And the first thing to do when you get a result is to look at it qualitatively and make sure everything makes sense. So if we kind of align this the way that the part was originally aligned, um, and if I hover over here, we'll see kind of where the I-beam was before the load was applied, before the, it was deformed, you can see that this end hasn't moved, which is what we wanted, and this end has deflected, uh, which is kind of compared to its uh, undeformed shape. And that's what we expect in a cantilever uh, loading scenario. Now note that this deformed shape is not um, what you would see in real life. There's a, if we go up in the upper left, there's a deformation scale of 24 to one. So this is 24 times more curved than what the real I-beam would look like. All right, so the, the overall shape looks reasonable. If we think about the stress pattern, we see that um, at, the, at this loaded end of the beam, the stress is low, which is what we expect because as we talked about in the topic reading, the, the moment is low here, the bending moment. And so we're gonna get uh, very little bending stress. Whereas on this uh, fixed end of the beam, we have high stress, which is what we expect. That's where the bending moment is high. If we zoom in on that fixed end, uh, we can see that, uh, again, as we expected, near the centroid at the middle, we have very low stress. And near the outer uh, surfaces at the top and bottom, we have higher stress. And that's what we expect because the Y term, the distance from the centroid is maximized at those top and bottom edges. And then finally, if we zoom in on these holes, we'll see that uh, that's where the highest stress is occurring. So exactly as we expected, these holes are concentrating stress uh, near their edges because the lines of force have to flow around them. And so we have much higher stretch, stress on the edge than in the center of the beam. Okay, so qualitatively, everything looks 
like we expected. That's really good. And it helps us uh, to understand if we're using the right simple models, uh, to have the right conceptual understanding of what's important about the loading and stress in this part. Now let's move on to quantitative analysis. Um, I'd like to see how these peak stresses compare to what we calculated. Uh, first, uh, let's see this, uh, this uh, uh, color code here is presented in Pascal's, which maybe uh, under some circumstances would be great, but we performed our analysis in computing in uh, PSI. So if we come down to this plot and right click on it, we can edit the definition and we'll get some options. And uh, the first one is which stress is being displayed. And we'll see this as the Homoiosis equivalent stress that we uh, discussed in the topic reading. So that's good. And then the second one is the unit. So let's choose PSI, green check mark, and we're going to go. And let's see, if we look at this scale over here, uh, most of the, the top of the beam is kind of green. So that's in that 20 KSI region, which is about what we calculated by hand. Let's say that we want to get a more accurate bead on that. We can right click on this and use the probe. And if we uh, click somewhere, it'll tell us exactly what the stress value is. And we're getting you know, 1.9 KSI, which is almost exactly what we calculated by hand. Great. Um, now the peak stress, we can actually just read it off the chart, getting 4.4 KSI. Uh, which is close to what we had, which was 5.4 KSI. It's a little low. And um, we can also notice that uh, if we look at this pattern of stress around the holes, it's changing quickly. Uh, so the stress is very low here and very high there. And you can sort of see some pixelation here implying that there aren't very many nodes and links there. And that can uh, result in lower accuracy. So let's do something to get a little bit better accuracy here, we'll uh, use an adaptive mesh. We'll come over to the definition of this study and go down to the properties. And uh, this pop-up will occur and we'll get uh, a few tabs. One is adaptive and we'll select adaptive, H adaptive and use the default settings and say, okay, and we'll rerun the study. Now what this adaptive meshing is going to do is it will run the study with the default mesh, which might be too coarse in some places uh, and uh, too refined in others. And then it will look for regions where the stress has changed rapidly over a uh, small distance and then add more nodes there and rerun as it's doing now, rerun the simulation uh, until it has, it estimates its accuracy is sufficiently high. So if we now uh, zoom in on these holes, we can see uh, many more uh, nodes. And actually, if we say uh, right-click here and show the mesh, it'll display, yes, many more uh, links and nodes. And, and you can sort of see that by looking at the pixelation. And uh, the stress has changed. And, and now it's more like 5.6 KSI, which is almost exactly what we estimated by hand. Uh, 5.4 KSI. All right, so that's how to analyze uh, or interpret the results of FEA stress analysis. Uh, there are a couple of other things we could look at here. One is displacement. And if we look at the displacement, things appear as we would expect. This end didn't move because it was fixed, and this end did move. And we can, if you'd like to know what the exact displacement is, we can use this uh, chart and, and the very tip here moved about one millimeter. I'm sorry, um, one centimeter. I've got to need the positive one there. So uh, this is a good way to, if you really care about the absolute displacement, you can see that. And then the last plot is the strain. And this is a little bit boring if you've looked at the stress analysis already, because as you remember from your solid mechanics course, stress and strain are linearly related. And so these uh, results look really similar. Okay, so that is how to uh, perform a basic finite element analysis to estimate stress in SOLIDWORKS.